And good afternoon, everyone. It's three o'clock here in Houston. My name is Randy Price. We are the Price Group and delighted to have you with us as far as our continuing information series on uh, all issues related to retirement. Our topic today is the retirement planning timeline. So uh, we'll be uh, on, on uh, target here for about 45 minutes. Time for questions. Uh, if, uh, if, you, if you have a question, so uh, be ready with that. Uh, who are we? We're a family owned and operated uh, investment and financial planning boutique, 40 plus years of experience. We follow a fiduciary standard and uh, what we do is retirement. 90% uh, of our clients are indeed retired. Uh, I'm Randy Price and he's Matt Price. A little bit about our firm. We are Steward Partners. We are a registered investment advisory firm. We operate as a fiduciary. We think that's uh, really critical. Uh, the firm is over $26 billion in assets. We're not owned by a bank or brokerage firm. We use Raymond James as a vendor, a back office. Uh, they're uh, uh, a very well-known Fortune 500 company. No TARP bailout funds in 2008. Uh, financially conservative, over two times their uh, respected capital requirement by the, uh, the federal government. And so they've been a good uh, partner, uh, but we are an independent firm. So the question you should be asking yourself, are these two knuckleheads worth listening to? Uh, Randy's humble, so I'll brag on his behalf. He's had uh, quite a few uh, awards from Barron's Forbes Financial Times. Both of us are certified financial planners. Randy and I both, we went to the University School of Wharton up in Pennsylvania uh, to receive our SEMA, our Certified Investment Management Analyst designation. So you're on our weekly email. You've probably seen our Wealth Code podcast, and uh, uh, we think credentials really matter in our, in our business. And uh, think think the next thirty minutes or so should be pretty valuable. So, what are we going to talk about today? Number one, retirement planning when you're two to five years out. Retirement planning when you're less than one year out. Drum roll, it's exciting. And then planning after retirement. So we'll cover those three and again, have some time for questions. So let's get started now with retirement planning um, two to five years out. We talk about looking before you leap. We think the foundation, the most important thing is to uh, invest your time before you invest your money. Create a wealth and an investment plan related to retirement. Develop a family index number. Matt's gonna talk about that a little bit later. Evaluate your retirement plan, contributions, allocations, what you've got to work with. Consider uh, the, uh, the, the effects of a negative uh, year in the stock market, the consequence it might have as far as making, uh, requiring you to work a little bit longer. And then uh, we think uh, if you can find a qualified advisor who specializes in this area, uh, they are well worth the time uh, to seek out and uh, have them give you some, uh, some pointers, some advice, some counsel, as far as uh, things to look out for. So is your spreadsheet adequate for retirement? Uh, Matt and I have seen a lot of spreadsheets. Literally one, I didn't think I was gonna be able to read even with a magnifying glass, but uh, anyway, um, uh, Let's talk about why a spreadsheet is not adequate for retirement. We have four boxes here. Let's focus on the boxes on the two left side, on the, le on the left side. So at the top, you see the years one through 10. So we're gonna, we're gonna assume you begin with $100,000 in assets. You get an average return of 7% and inflation is 3%. So year one, we're gonna assume you get a negative 15% rate of return, seven, 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 all the way down. And then in year 10, get a 29% positive rate of return. And voila, year in value, end of year 10, $188,399. So let's do this. Let's move uh, right below that. Let's reverse the return for the best year and do that in 29% positive rate of return in year one. And let's do the negative 15% rate of return in year 10 with the sevens all in between. What you'll find is, no difference, $188,399 at the end of the period. So this has been 
where every retiree has been living, it didn't matter whether your return was good at first or whether your, your good return was at the end or your good return was in the middle. But once you start retirement, that all changes. The little box there to the right sequence can have a dramatic effect on the returns when you retire and you move toward the distribution phase. So what happens in retirement? We're gonna start taking an inflation adjusted withdrawal, $10,000 the first year, $10,300 the second year and so on. And so we're gonna take the negative 15% in year one. Bad news is that $100,000 account goes negative in year 10. But if you uh, have the positive 29% followed by the 15% negative in year 10 on the bottom uh, right, <clears throat> what you have is a balance left of over $52,000. So the sequence has a dramatic effect on returns. So what does that mean? It means that retirement is a different type of scenario and uh, we need to stay away as much as we can from a losing year, especially when we start our distributions. So we think you need more than just an investment guy. You need a wealth coach. Uh, one of uh, the famous people in uh, the finance uh, uh, books is a guy named Benjamin Graham. He was Warren Buffett's mentor. He said, quote, the best way to measure your investing success is not by whether you're beating, a, beating the market, but whether you put into place a financial plan and a behavioral discipline, very important, <clears throat> that's likely to get you where you wanna go. So we talk about holistic financial planning, tax planning, retirement planning, investments, insurance, cash flow, estate plannings. We would also add leaving a legacy there. What do you want your money to do for you? And uh, again, that's what a good wealth coach should do. Matt, what should a retirement plan include? Yeah, so retirement is not an event. Sometimes we think of it as kind of a photograph or a snapshot in time, but really from a financial perspective, it's a working document. It's an ongoing process. And in our humble opinion, we don't think you actually have a retirement plan until it's written down. Uh, so when we are creating a retirement roadmap, we call it a live well plan. We're trying to answer quite a few questions, but a few of the main ones we get asked about on a regular and consistent basis, how much can I spend in retirement? This can be kind of twofold. It can be you're trying to make the ends meet. How much can you spend thinking about this generation? Or sometimes uh, you say, hey, you know what? I have enough. It's just how much are my kids going to inherit? And so we we can help determine based on goals how much you would like to leave to the next generation how much you can still spend in a perfect world we're we're only spending income not principal but sometimes that's not not possible and uh, that's kind of a good commercial there on we'll talk about our dividend stock strategy here later but uh we we think income really is the name of the game in retirement and then on top of that, what rate of return do you need to be, quote, successful? And every family defines success a little bit differently. Uh, we'll talk about our family index number here in a second. But our goal, unless you would tell us otherwise, is to illustrate you taking the least amount of risk possible for you to be successful. And then, you know, like Randy mentioned, spreadsheets being inadequate in retirement, even though they worked really well during your career, uh, same can hold true with, with investing a portfolio. Investing prior to retirement looks a whole lot different than investing during retirement. So a little bit more about that family index number, it's the rate of return that is very specific to you. So you could have a neighbor, colleague at work, a friend who also is a client of ours, and you could have completely different family index numbers. So we create this and tailor this based off of your live well plan to help us determine how much risk you need to take in the portfolio. When we say risk, we're really talking about what percentage of stocks do you need to own versus some boring docile investments like an enhanced cash alternative, maybe some, some fixed income as, as well. So our goal is to help clients uh, take a lot of the noise 
out of their personal finances. And so, you know, there's so many different stock market indexes you can follow, the S&P, the Russell, the Dow, the NASDAQ, et cetera. And instead of tracking our progress against a specific index, whether it's for stocks or bonds, we we track it against this family index number. And so year over year, we're trying to to determine, are you ahead of track? Are you behind track? Are you right on track? And uh, as we say here, it replaces complexity with clarity by helping you understand the rate of return that you don't want, but you really need to be successful. Here's a, we were afraid we were gonna to have to take this slide out of the presentation just a few weeks ago, just because the, the Biden tax law looked like it was gonna go through. And then right after Christmas, it stalled and nothing got, got done. So as of the time of the recording today is January 12th, this is still possible. Uh, now there could be something where a law is put into place where it's retroactive to the 1st of January. So uh, we obviously don't give tax advice, but that, that's something to, to take into account. But as of today, we still can do this. What you do is you take a non-deductible contribution into an IRA account, and then the very next day, you can convert that into a Roth account. Any gain would be taxed, but if you put in 6,000 on a Tuesday, you converted it on a Wednesday, there's obviously no growth, no, no gain on that. What we need to be careful about is the pro rata rule, which is step three there in the picture. Do you have any pre-existing IRA accounts? You have to do it on a pro rata basis. And so this really doesn't work well if you have other IRA accounts. Now, if you only have 401k accounts, the pro rata rule does not count towards 401k accounts. So a uh, great way to to make a what we call a backdoor Roth IRA contribution. And obviously the Roth account, in our opinion, is far superior to a traditional 401k or IRA account because the money grows not tax deferred, but tax free. And then in retirement, you obviously don't pay any income taxes when you take the money out. And here's our kind of second little nugget, a backdoor Roth 401k contribution. Sounds like what we just talked about, but uh, it's kind of the cousin, I would say, of our first idea. This is inside a 401k account. A lot of 401k providers will allow you to make an after-tax contribution and then do this conversion as well. So any after-tax contributions, whether it's you're still at the uh, still at the company or at the time of retirement, you can roll those over into a Roth IRA, which once again, we think is far superior than to just cashing it out or uh, uh, rolling it into an IRA. So the devil's in the details. And as always, uh, consult with your tax counsel uh, with regards to your specific uh, situation. But uh, again, things have been very valuable in the past. Let's talk about... Uh, your, your risk budget, what would a 25% correction in the stock market do to your retirement? Uh, we've seen many people very heavy in their company stock or uh, sort of paying more attention to the company business than they had their own business and they get up uh, close to retirement and they're like, uh, wow, I'm you know, 80, 85, 90% uh, stocks because the stocks have done so well relative to the, uh, the bonds, fixed income, cash in there. So it's a good time. Again, we're two to five years out in our discussion here. What percentage are you invested in stocks? What does it look like from what you uh, uh, and your family uh, would consider a, a, a good risk budget during retirement? Um, and if you're sort of, hey, I'd be more comfortable with sort of 50-50 or 60-40 or 40-60, then uh, obviously at some point in time, you've got to start moving toward that lower percentage in stocks. Uh, this interesting graph here that shows <clears throat> if you had 50% um, of the upside and 50% of the downside, it's a much smoother, uh, much smoother ride, uh, but you sort of get to the same place over, over time. So uh, anyway, we think that is uh, something certainly worth uh, consideration. And um, 
There are ways to sort of look at uh, uh, the risk in your portfolio. Risk, uh, as uh, many people are finding out with interest rates going up, risk in your fixed income portfolio, as well as uh, the risk that most everybody thinks about, and that is a, of a stock market decline. Many of you have heard of uh, Peter Lynch. Perhaps you've even read his uh, book, Beating the Street. Uh, Peter Lynch was a uh, well-known mutual fund manager. Uh, at one time, his mutual fund was uh, the largest mutual fund on the planet. And uh, he was giving a talk one day, and uh, uh, he finished his talk and uh, had a time for question and answers. And the hand went up, uh, and uh, he called on the first person. Mr. Lynch, what is uh, your most disappointing thing, your, your disappointing part of your career as a, uh, as, a, as a manager for this uh, mutual fund company? And he said, oh, that's really simple. And the reporter later told us that he expected, well, I should have bought you know, Amazon or Apple or some stock that done phenomenally well uh, over, over time. But he said, it's very simple. And he said, this really bothers me. He said, the average person in my mutual fund earned nowhere near the average return of my fund. Let's unpack that a little bit. Mutual fund companies can tell advisor, or excuse me, uh, client number 185 you know, or 101,886 when they put money in, when they take money out, and they can, uh, they can tell with the, with the help of the computer, whether they've had a positive rate of return, negative rate of return, or what rate of return they have. And uh, what, what, what has happened is for many people with mutual fund investments, like other investments, emotions get in the way. People don't buy low and sell high, which is obviously the old joke, uh, but uh, they many times buy high and sell low. Mistakes get much more costly, think about that, as you approach, as you approach retirement. Not only are you working with more money, the, probably the most money that you've ever worked with in time, but you don't have the time frame in place to, to, to ride out another market up and down unless you want to delay your retirement. Uh, hiring an advisor uh, is a stress, stress reduction technique. Uh, what we find is uh, many clients have not uh, seen, heard of, or had access to alternative investments. Some uh, other strategies for uh, fixed income or the use of some individual bonds where needed. And uh, as uh, studies will show, the average investor has over time underperformed. So uh, again, uh, we think uh, certainly a consideration as you get close to retirement to consider sitting down and talking to an advisor. Okay, that's two to five years out. So uh, time has passed and now you're less than, uh, than one year out. Matt, what are we going to do when we're one year out? Yeah, here's a little laundry list. Uh, feel free to take a picture of it. Uh, happy to, to to share this recording with you all afterwards as well. We are we are recording this, but we want to estimate how much income you think you're going to need in retirement. And we never like to use the B word, a budget. We like to call it cash flow projections. That sounds a lot better rolling off the tongue than, than saying budget, but we're, we're solving for how much money do we need to produce on a regular and consistent basis. Pension versus lump sum, this will be one of the biggest financial decisions you arguably make in your whole life. Uh, so what do interest rates do? Where do we think interest rates are going? How do we solve for the, the net present value of that? We have a good spreadsheet that we use to help explain this in, in detail. Uh, under 59 and a half versus over 59 and a half. If you're retiring early prior to 59 and a half, you obviously are not going to be able to get into the 401k assets without a penalty. There are a few ways around that. So that's a big piece, something that we'll, we'll talk about here briefly. Uh, creating a retirement income strategy. You know, rule number one in retirement is let's produce income. Rule number two, do not forget rule number one. Uh, Talking about the discount rate, number five kind of applies to pension versus lump, lump sum. It can make a whole lot of difference retiring a month early or a month later based on where interest rates are for that pension lump sum or, or annuity option. And then looking at taxation, for a lot of people, 
their ordinary income is going to fall in that first year of retirement. And so capital gains tax rates, it's still on a sliding scale to where when your income is lower, theoretically, you could have a lot lower or in some cases a zero capital gains tax rate in that first year of retirement. And like we've talked about, we think walking through this process, it's like anything in life, doing it your first time. There's a lot of unknowns, sometimes, uh, you know, causes nervous, nervousness, anxiety, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, Randy's been doing this 35 plus years. I've been doing this 11 plus years and it's not our first rodeo. So things get progressively easier when you do them on a regular and consistent basis. Yeah, and uh, again, that qualified and fiduciary centric advisor team, we think is, uh, is, is critical. Uh, sit down, kick the tires, um, let them show you uh, the value at historically their value added and uh, determine where you need help in retirement. So uh, uh, again, we're one year out. What are your income needs in retirement? We're uh, for the first time in several years learning how to respell the word inflation. Uh, numbers today talked about 7% year over year. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the rule of 72. You take 72 and divide by the inflation rate, that will tell you how long it would take the cost of living to double. So uh, for several years, we've had that 2% inflation. So, you know, 72 but divided by two is 36. That's a long, that's a long time, 36 years. But if you would get 7% uh, inflation going forward, 72 divided by seven is about 10. So uh, your cost of living could double every 10 years. So you retire at 60, it could double at 70, it could double at 80. Uh, so on and so forth. So uh, we think uh, inflation, inflation, inflation. Uh, we call inflation the hidden tax. Income needs in retirement. Uh, my joke is the bank of mom and dad is always open. Uh, it's open night, nights, weekends, and holidays. Uh, what are your big ticket items? Are you going to travel? Uh, perhaps things ease up with the uh, with the virus and people can get around the the, uh, the country around the world uh, more easily, but uh, a lot of times uh, people have, uh, you know, some, some purchases they've been uh, looking to make, fix up the house, uh, a new vehicle, gifts for kids, uh, so on and so forth. What are your uh, ongoing fixed and variable expenses? Obviously, if uh, we have a, uh, a negative period in the markets, you want to know what you can cut, and uh, it's easy to cut more more easy to cut variable expenses than it is fixed expenses. And then many people are are making gifts, state planning gifts, or just gifts uh, to uh, to uh, to have fun and, uh, and 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 share with the next generation. Rule of thumb, though, 70, 80 percent of your final salary prior to retirement should uh, should take care of you. Put that into after tax numbers. People typically uh, are living on half of what they make. So if your salary at work is a hundred thousand, my guess is that you're spending about fifty. Our guess is that you're spending about fifty thousand dollars per year after tax. After you pay Social Security, after you pay income tax, after you put some money in the four hundred one k, after this, after that. So uh, anyway, that is uh, something to uh, to be aware of. And again, in our recommended live well plan we go into this in great detail. Okay, a lot of you have, um, have talked about or read article, or have seen articles about how much money you can take out uh, during retirement. There's been several articles written and uh, we hear people as they come in say, I can take out 4%, right? And we sort of say, well, let's talk about that. Uh, there was a title of an article that was catchy. It said, is 3% the new 4%? Uh, the, the study that said you could take out 4%, ride the ups and downs, and still never run out of, mon run out, run out of money was done over a period where interest rates are much higher. So obviously, when you invest for retirement, you have some money typically in uh, things that grow, stocks, and you typically have some, uh, some money in non-stock investments. That produce income and sort of act as a, a little bit of a uh, dampening factor uh, ballast, if you will, for the portfolio. And fixed income rates are very low today. The 10-year U.S. government bond, even after coming up here, is uh, still less than 1.8%. So uh, 
if you factor in where, where bonds are now and you look forward for one, three, five, seven, ten 10 years and you, and you look at that, although 4% has worked in most markets historically, going back to 1926, sometimes history throws us a little bit of a curveball. And what if interest rates are higher and we don't make any money on fixed income for several years? So again, we go through a Monte Carlo simulation. We'll talk about that where we, we factor in some variable uh, rates of return and it's to give you uh, feedback on what would happen if your rate of return is less than what you expect. So uh, again, a lot of uh, more planning perhaps that goes into this than used to based on some low interest rates. A uh, company pension versus lump sum, we briefly mentioned this, but the, the pension is good, income for life. You're letting the company take the investment risk on there. Uh, there's limited flexibility from a standpoint, no, no kind of one-time, big-time purchases that you can make. You just get that monthly check month after month. We think the real con to the company pension is diminishing purchase power because of inflation. And, and we a question we kind of ask people who are who are making this big decision, what is the outlook for inflation in your mind? And and from there that will help us determine not totally but help start the conversation on on which which uh, option is is best for you and your family. If inflation was low for the next 20, 30, 40 years, there's an argument to be made for the company pension. But if we're in a rising interest rate environment historically inflation is also rising when interest rates are moving higher that purchasing power is going to diminish diminish on a quicker basis a lot of different options to how to take this single or joint life you know we joke and say tell us how long you're going to live and we'll tell you <laughs> exactly how to do this but uh, there are some non-company annuity alternatives typically don't get the same rate, but it is something we can look at and consider if you want you want the best of both worlds. And some companies now are, are offering a, a partial, take half lump sum, half pension. But the, the lump sum option, more flexibility, more ability to pass money to the next generation, inflation protection if you do own stocks, uh, has some ability for some estate planning, but you can spend through the capital. And so, do you have a, an investment process? Do you have someone you can trust? Where do interest rates go from here? And uh, the spreadsheet that I briefly mentioned earlier helps us determine that break even of when comparing the lump sum and the pension. So that's a big part of the Live Well plan. And we this is one of the things we really enjoy talking just because it's so important to, to each family that's that's making this decision. So looking here at early retirement, if you're retiring before 59 and a half, here are a few ways or a few things to consider as means to access some of your pre-tax dollars without paying a penalty. You can make a one-time distribution when rolling the funds over. Uh, 72T, this is something where you can set up systematic payments and make the payments for until you're 59 and a half or for five years, it has to be the greater of those two metrics and uh, those payments will not have the 10% penalty assessed. Uh, net unrealized appreciation. This is where you take the, if you own any company stock inside the 401k, you take the stock out, you pay ordinary income on the basis, which you paid for it. And those funds can roll outside of the 401k into an after-tax account and uh, able to access those funds uh, until you would turn 59 and a, and a half. You know, a line of credit, a lot of clients, if they do retire early, are, are doing some time of part-time part work, consulting, et cetera. And then obviously any after-tax assets that you already have on hand. So we, we said we were gonna come back to dividends. We think dividend stocks are really good for people who are still accumulating and saving for retirement, but they're even more important 
to a retiree. And so here's a look at each decade dating back to the 1940s. And the royal blue percentage there is the amount of the, the percentage that the dividends played as a total return, total return being dividend plus appreciation or depreciation uh, in that decade. So you can see the long-term average of 41% there on the right that dividends account for about 40% of the overall stock market returns for the last, whatever that is, 80 years or so, uh, 90 years or so. So with that being said, we think dividends are really important. And on top of that, we think it's even more important to try to isolate the companies that not only pay dividends, but have a history and a propensity to increase those dividends every year moving forward. And that's one of the main ways you can fight this inflation battle in retirement is have a growing income stream from the your dividend income. So uh, let's talk about uh, fixed income. Let's talk about bonds. Bonds will be corporate bonds or tax-free bonds or CDs or anything that pays a fixed uh, rate of interest over time. Let's look at three periods of return historically. Uh, you were working and decided to retire in 1920, wondering what to do with the money you'd save during retirement. And you said, well, I'm gonna stick with Uncle Sam. And you invested uh, in some treasury notes. That's a government bond that typically has a maturity of one to 10 years. And uh, voila, on a real rate of return, real rate means after inflation, uh, you made 6.4%, you live very well. Someone was retiring uh, about that same time, 1941, and they said, I'm not sure what to do, but uh, I'm going to stay with a, a government bond program. And so over that 40-year period, 40 years, long time, real rate of return after subtracting inflation. So in other words, if you got 10% on a bond and inflation was 10%, you made zero. That's how the real rate of return is calculated. But uh, you lost 1.9% a year every year over a 40-year period. Obviously not good for purchasing power, obviously not good for transferring wealth, obviously not good for a number of things. But that uh, historically is 100% uh, is accurate. Then 1982, remember what happened? Money market interest rates were way high. They came down. Uh, you know, mortgages were up in the 14, 15, 16%. But for the period from 1982 to 2009, again, measuring it on a real rate of return, treasury notes made over 6%, 6.6%. So you say, well, Randy, that's very interesting. Matt, uh, okay, door number one, door number two, door number three. But tell me, what does your crystal ball say about what's going to happen today going forward? And wow, I wish we knew, but safe bonds maybe a bit of an oxymoron from a standpoint of the rising interest rates coupled with um, some inflation put us in position where the fixed income portion of the portfolio does not nearly make as much. Now it has ramifications on your cash flow, that has ramifications on your family index number, that has ramifications on how you invest your money, et cetera, et cetera. So this is all part of what we call investing with a process. But as the next slide shows, people are prone to invest without a process. A little bit of a busy chart, but I think a picture is worth a thousand words, especially here. So the, uh, the, uh, the dark green is the S&P performance. So you can see the line there that starts from the left and moves to the right. That dark green line is the, the, the performance of the 500 largest stocks, affectionately called the S&P 500. What you see, the light green, is the, uh, is the uh, equity flows, when people are putting money into stocks. So you can see right there um, uh, with the circle that in a period when stocks have been doing very well for an extended period of time, people were putting the most amount into stock mutual funds, buying individual stocks. Looks like the market is doing well. I don't want to miss out. And so they put money into those investments. And what happens? The market retreats and goes, goes down. 
Let's look at the, uh, the other circle there to the right, selling low. Where is that? That's 2008. Uh, and what happened is the stock market takes a huge discount based on a number of uh, factors and uh, has a really big down year. And rather than people saying, wow, stock market's on sale, I can buy this stock for a great dividend, or uh, I think the, the, it's going to recover, they sell stocks. And what do they do? Up above that, you see the gray line is the flow of money into fixed income, into bonds, into bond mutual funds, goes to an all-time high. People are scared, and yeah, it was a very scary time, but if you'd had an investment process, you would have had some capital available, and uh, you would have been taking some profits as stocks were going higher, and uh, had some ability to reposition some assets to your, uh, to your gain uh, when you got an opportunity to buy things on sale. So why do you need an investment process? How do you invest your portfolio to meet your, your retirement needs? Unfortunately, uh, a lot of people make poor financial decisions when they're stressed out. I mean, there's reasons for this. There's been studies. They don't get, let emotions get in the way of logic and, uh, and reason. Uh, we think discipline is important. We think income generation uh, is important. There are core principles that we use of our process-driven investment strategy. Um, you know, just one tidbit. Let's just say you were 100% invested in stocks, and we don't have uh, many clients that are 100% invested in stocks, but if your cash flow for retirement was being met by the dividends off the stock, and the stock market's down 10 or 15 or 20 or 25 or 30, um, you know, your, your principal is down. We, uh, we joke and say, hey, that's a problem for the next generation, but your income, unless those companies cut their dividends, is, uh, is not an issue. You can still go on that trip. You can still do what you're, you're, you're thinking on planning on doing. And uh, even in 2009, following the, uh, the big 50% uh, uh, peak to trough for the stock market, we still had our dividend stock portfolio register some small gains as far as increasing the dividends. So our goal, protect your assets, generate income, generate growth. What you need personally to meet your objectives with the least amount of risk. So an investment process we think is, uh, is very helpful and uh, we find it lacking in a lot of people that we sit down and talk to. Matt, what do we do planning after retirement? Planning after retirement, and this is kind of at retirement, after retirement, this is what we do on a regular and reoccurring basis for retired clients. We're, we're stress testing the portfolio. And so if you're, if you think about this, I don't think it's very intuitive. If you are taking out, let's look at 4% uh, of the portfolio and the market's down 20%, you might say, well, I need a 20% uh, rate of return to get back to break even. Assuming that in 3% inflation rate, you don't need a 20% to get back to break even, you need 36%. And so those drawdowns in retirement are a lot more costly than they were prior to retirement. And uh, so that's something we're always doing. We're always stress testing the portfolio. We're always looking to see how much risk is, is currently present. Do we need to trim some risk? The, the more, the, the opposite of that is also true. Last, or I guess not last spring, but two springs ago, 2020 during COVID, stocks were down about 30% at the low. We're having conversations with clients and now's the time to add never feels good when, when it's the right time to buy stocks. It, it's kind of makes you feel queasy to, to go ahead and do it, but it's turned out to, to, to be a good uh, run since then with, with actually very historically low volatility since that, that COVID timeframe for a number of different reasons. So a couple of planning but, ideas for consideration is we, uh, move toward the uh, end of uh, end of the webinar. If you've got assets generating uh, income, dividend paying, paying stocks, many times you would want, want to hold those in your IRA accounts, your qualified accounts. Uh, if you're uh, age 70 or more and making charitable contributions, give them from your IRA, what we call a qualified charitable distribution is a great, great planning idea. If you don't have an IRA, but you've got some appreciated stocks, charities, uh, most all of them, are more than willing to, uh, to take uh, some of those shares and 
you still want to own the stock, you can rebuy the stock at a higher cost basis, some real value there. But uh, where, what we do is we look to where optimally take out distributions for retirement is a combination of from your IRA, combination of selling some assets, combination of spending down some perhaps some cash. Uh, we did a lot of Roth conversions last year and still looking at it this year where the uh, income tax rates could uh, go appreciably higher. Uh, you know, if you uh, have too big of an IRA, you might be uh, uh, set up to, to have a penalty for that. And so uh, we'll talk with you about that. But um, planning and retirement should be benchmarked against your goals. And so we're goal oriented. We like uh, to, uh, to sit down uh, uh, several times with folks. And uh, again, our live well plan is a living document where each year we come back and we say, are we on track ahead of schedule, uh, behind schedule and make uh, plans accordingly for that. So if you've never done a live well plan, uh, we would certainly welcome an opportunity to sit down with you. Uh, we talk about the three C's, clarity, comfort, and confidence. Many times what happens is when people have clarity for the first time, it's sort of an aha moment. So the clarity leads to, um, to confidence. The confidence will lead to comfort. Comfort uh, is really what everybody's uh, uh, wanting during retirement, sort of a nice smooth ride with uh, some nice uh, shock absorbers built in. And again, when you have it written down, uh, we think it's, uh, it's much easier to have that uh, comfort and confidence as you move through retirement. Uh, we've got some information on uh, 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 10 questions you should ask a, uh, a potential financial advisor. Uh, fiduciary standard, does the, does the person represent, uh, the team represent you or a bank brokerage firm? Do they have a transparent cost structure? Um, what is the experience of the group? Uh, certified financial planner, certified investment management analyst. Uh, do they have a succession plan? Um, uh, if you have a medical condition and you need to see a heart doctor, you want a heart doctor that does hearts every day, early morning, afternoon, late into the, uh, the, the, the afternoon. Not someone that does big toes on Tuesday, hearts on Wednesday, and uh, may take a gallbladder out on Thursday if they need to be. Uh, you matter. What uh, You deserve a personalized retirement plan, not a cookie cutter, something generated that, that can be done in... Uh, in, uh, in two minutes while you're waiting in the lobby to see them. Uh, our team uh, feels it's very important to have a low client to advisor ratio. Do, does the people you're considering communicate well, speak to you in a manner which you can uh, understand and communicate? Um, do they provide a written holistic plan? We try to uh, antici anticipate our clients' needs. You know, the, the hockey uh, analogy is uh, they ask, um, uh, a great hockey player, how he was so good. And he said, well, I skate, uh, most people skate to where, where the puck is. I skate to where I think the puck is going to be. So, uh, but uh, we are, are big on communication. And if you'd like to uh, receive our complimentary guide, 10 questions you should ask uh, a financial advisor, uh, please email us after the, uh, uh, after the program. So uh, we appreciate your time. We are running right on time. Um, Again, feel free to reach out with questions or comments. Uh, I'm Randy, he's Matt, uh, that's Maddie, Tiffany, and, uh, and Melissa in the picture as well. And uh, we would love to, uh, to uh, help you in any way that we could. Matt, any uh, questions come in before we go? Don't see any as of right now, but uh, like Randy said, <clears throat> shoot us an email, give us a call, and we'd be happy to talk about it in more detail. So again, on behalf of the whole price group, thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of the afternoon. Happy New Year and hope to see you uh, next time for another price group webinar.